Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm seeing in the chat box now we have participants from Denmark and Jamaica, Zurich, uh, Korea, all over the world. So excited for the presentation today and hope to show you uh, something that might be useful for you in your Kubernetes and microservices journey. My name is Drew Gazowski. I am a territory account executive here at Traffic Labs. Also aboard the call is Jakob Hajek. Uh, Hello. Who is, a, hey, so who is a product adoption specialist? Just a quick agenda about what we're going to be talking about today is uh, sort of a general overview about challenges and authentication in microservice environments, especially in Kubernetes. We're going to run through how we look to solve those problems with some technical demonstrations led by Jakob as well as uh, summarize the whole thing up and make sure that we leave a little bit of time at the end, hopefully for a Q and A. A few words about Traffic Labs and the uh, trajectory that we're taking into this conversation. Traffic Labs was founded in 2016, it's 40 people and it, it has a total of $14 million in funding. A few words on scale. So Traffic Labs is the world's most commonly chosen uh, solution for ingress into containerized environments. We have over 2 billion downloads. And when you start counting things in the billions, uh, typically they slow down. But for us, it's actually speeding up. So these numbers are a bit out of date. It's over 2.4 billion today. Um, some of our biggest users and customers are going to be names that are familiar to you. Uh, they're some of the most recognizable brands in the, in the world. So now we're gonna take a look at some of the challenges that we solve for our clients in uh, authentication in Kubernetes. And uh, Jakob and Patricia and I were talking in advance of the meeting. We thought that it'd be really useful if we could sort of present some questions that we look to answer in this meeting. And these questions that we look to answer are, what are the advantages of performing authentication at the proxy layer rather than the services themselves? And how does one authenticate uh, at the proxy layer using Traffic Enterprise Edition? So again, sort of what's the fundamental problem about what we're trying to solve? And then how do we solve it? So traffic proxy, our world famous proxy solution to containerized environments, uh, represents the middle portion of this architecture diagram where traffic originates in the internet and it's pushed out to the, the services themselves. Traditionally, how services are authenticated is that the authentication happens within the services themselves. Service A authenticates, service B authenticates, and service C authenticates. But you run into trouble at scale when you don't have three services, but you have 300 services and you have to maintain 300 separate registries. How traffic, how, how we see the industry, how we see the industry moving is that uh, folks who are working in this sort of microservices world are beginning to perform the authentication task at the proxy layer. So rather than maintaining 300 authentication registries, you're able to maintain it in a single place, which is the ingress proxy. And just as a bit of context on that, we see some of the world's biggest uh, Fortune 500 brands, Fortune 10 brands, uh, really charging hard at this at this uh, architecture. So, from a traffic standpoint, we support all of the following technologies: LDAP, OIDC, JWT, HMAC, and MTLS. It's a situation where we see that to be the most common and forward-thinking set of authentication mechanisms in the world today. And I think at this point, I relinquish command of the meeting to, to Jakub. Yes. Okay, very good. I'm going to stop sharing. And you're up. So hello, everyone. Let me share my screen and let me continue the presentation. Yes, I believe you are able to see my screen. So let me start presenting. Yeah, so today we are going to talk about the, a couple of the uh, authentication strategies that are already implemented in Traffic Enterprise, as well as on Traffic Proxy 
I will I will mention which of those strategies are already on enterprise and what are already available on uh, traffic proxy. So uh, before to understand Open ID Connect, because it will be the one of the first uh, authentication strategies that I'm going to describe and give you a demo how it works, we need to first understand what is the OAuth. So, but it, you know, in order to understand OAuth, we need to we need to think about how internet looks before that protocol. So let's imagine that we have a that we have an online photo printing agency. That's the that's of course example. I, I'm not sure that company even exists. So we have a company that that prints uh, photos. So we would like to ask them to print our uh, uh, photos that are stored on the Google Photo. And what we can do, we can we can do we can just download our photo, photo to and store them on USB flash drive and send them to them, or we can share the credentials with them and then and they can log into the Google to get our photo. That's very unsecure. We don't know where our data, where our credentials are stored, what access we can give them by sharing the credentials. So. But before or out, there were no any easy way to manage that kind of a process. So after that, when out has been invented, we were able to solve that kind of a problems. So the first problem that we that that all out solve is how to access my data without giving access without giving my, my login credentials to to third party. In that case, third party, this is actually that online photo printing agency. And how we can grant permission to the specific scopes, to the specific actions on a Google Photo uh, uh, album? Because we would like to share just only one album. We don't want to share everything. So we would like to scope the number of grants and number of privileges that we are going to assign. And once the permissions are granted, how we can easily revoke them? Because we 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 don't want to. Uh, keep that uh, keep that permission uh, uh, for for the long time. We would like to, we will, we would like to just share them for a uh, to to get the pictures to to print them, and we would like to revote it. And that process actually uh, that I just described is a delegated authorization because we can delegate authorization to the external uh, identity provider, and in that case, our identity provider will be Google, and we will share some of the resources and those resources are called actually in our example in my example it will be photo and third party that online agency can use those uh, shared delegated authorization in, in order to print photo for us so we need to dive a little bit into into terminology to to understand better the protocol so we have a couple of the couple of the uh, uh, terminology and the first is a resource owner so it's actually user who is behind the keyboard I'm the owner of my data so I'm the resource owner and the client this uh, is actually the third party application application that is looking for uh, to get access to our data so authorization server in our case it's a server that owns our identity it might be Google, it might be any other identity provider. In my live demo, I will show you that we will deploy a simple identity provider that is called Keycloak. We will create user, we create some specific configuration in order to protect our application. And the resource server, that's actually a system that keeps our, uh, uh, our data. So in our case, it might be uh, a system where our photos are stored. Sometimes authorization server and resource servers are the same, but in that case, they are split into two separate roles. And what is the authorization grant? That's actually the grant that we as a resource owner, we can allow access to, uh, to the resources uh, actually uh, and create a temporary grant. And access token, that's actually generated token based on the authorization grant to get to get access to the resources. It might sound a little bit difficult right now, but I have a uh, quite nice uh, diagram, uh, quite nice authentication flow to, to, under, to help you understand that protocol. So let's go back to my example. And we, we, we have a client that is online printing agency and we have an authorization server. And on, that, uh, on the client, we have a button to log in through Google to authorize 
through Google. So we can click that button and during that uh, request we will be sending redirected URL. Sometimes it's, it is called it is called callback URL, response type client client ID and scope. Scope is very important uh, 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 parameter here because we can set what kind of a scopes we are going to uh, to get access to on the resource server. So in the next step, the client is checking whether a session is active because we need to be already authorized on the Google in order to give us some um, access to, to resource to the to access to some resources. So if the session is active, actually nothing will happen. If the session is not active, we will be prompted to enter our login credentials, our login and, and password. And what is important here that 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 form will be displayed on the accounts.google.com. It's it will not be displayed on the client, so we might be pretty sure that the data, uh, our credentials will not be uh, uh, are safe because it's happening on the Google site. Uh, if we are already, uh, if we if we uh, enter our password, we will have a consent form. That's actually very important because now we can deny or allow if we are going to uh, uh, give access to the specific resources. If you click deny, the entire process is, is finished. If we click allow, we can go further. And in that process, we in the next step, we exchange authorization code between client and between uh, authorization server. And that's important to understand that all of those steps that I just explained they are happening in a front channel. So what is the front channel? This is actually our browser. So we can think that our browsers are, are pretty safe, but we are calling that front channel because all those authorization code might be visible in the URL. So it's, it's secure, but it's less secure than communication between servers. And in that case, we can see that we exchange access token using authorization code client ID client secret but it is happening in a back channel so back channel is a communication between servers so it's very secure it's encrypted and we based on authorization code and those data that we are sending in the one of the steps we are getting access token and if you have that access token we can now communicate with authorization server in order to get photos in order to get actually any data uh, that we granted in the previous steps. So I just briefly explained how that OAuth works. So now we can we can think about it where that uh, protocol, uh, how it's how it fit into the OIDC, Open ID Connect, because this is actually what we are going to present today. So Open ID Connect is actually for authentication because OAuth 2.0 it's for authorization. Authorization is a granting access to the specific specific resources and some, sometimes it, it was used for authentication however there are no any there were no any standardization so the integration was very difficult and very complex and once we have an open id connect and we have a buff system that that supports that protocol we can easily integrate them together and we can we can actually do that on the service layer as drew mentioned if you have a few services, that's actually not a big deal. But if you have a much, much more services, it, it's actually uh, much better and easier to implement that actually authentication on a proxy layer in one place that will keep that we can that the maintenance will be much easier and, and uh, the development will be much faster because it will happen on the proxy layer. So now let's imagine, let's try to think about What's the difference between the process that I just described and where is actually that open ID? So we have a first and second step. And if you are going to use open ID, we need to just add the scope that is called open ID. And if our authorization server and client supports open ID, we will, we will receive ID token. And based on that, together with access token, and based on the token, we will be able to authenticate and get access to the specific resources on a resource server. So other steps are are, are the same. There is nothing nothing has been changed. The only two very tiny changes have been added to to the step number two, and between exchanging and in the last step in the exchanging the 
token. So the token that I just described, it is called a JWT token. It's JSON web token. It is sometimes pronounced JOT. So you can have you can have heard that your developers is using JOT to authenticate uh, to get some resources. So that that all, that token, it's a JSON object. It has a specific structure. That's very important to understand that it, it has a couple of the important structures. So the first is a header. The body is a payload that all data are are available and a signature and as you can see signature this is a, 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 this is a stamp so we are pretty sure that it's trusted token it, it hasn't been changed during the um, um, during the network so if we already understand OAuth and we know what is the open ID we can now think about how traffic enterprise implement that uh, that complex actually uh, flow because everything everything is happening on a middleware and that middleware is a piece of code that you are just adding to the traffic enterprise and you create you configure everything related to the OAuth and open id actually on that layer so it's much easier because most of the work is already implemented in middleware so you don't have to bother yourself your developers to do that so it's uh, actually the entire process is already explained here so very similar to that one that I just dis displayed, uh, explained. So it's all about the theory. Let me show the, how the, uh, my demo works. So I already created the demo. It's pre-recorded. Let me start my uh, presentation, uh, my recording. So everything what I'm going to present today will be uh, is is created is deployed on Kubernetes. So let me let me start and I will just yeah. So I will check whether my cluster is up and running. And now I need to deploy a traffic enterprise. So I create execute specific comment to deploy traffic enterprise. I'm checking whether the resources are already created. I need to switch to the specific uh, namespace in order to see whether um, the pods have been created and as you can see there are uh, three controllers three proxies and one pod responsible for registry for plugin registry they are not yet ready because it is it is taking some time to to settle the cluster to make it uh, uh, fully uh, working so the yeah it's taking some time the pods are getting started and now let me check. Yeah, both of all of them are up and running. Now I need to switch context to be connected to that cluster that I just created. And I use a variable here that is exported in my CLI comma, uh, command line in my terminal. I'm changed, I change the context. I'm just execute the command tctl get notes to see what are the what is the cluster topology. So again, we see three controllers, three proxies and one plugin registry. And we can see what is actually the leader because we have a quorum here, uh, uh, specific uh, um, controllers that are responsible for keeping a cluster states. And we can, we know that cluster is up and running because all of the uh, components have status ready. Yeah, let's check once again the pods and the services as you can see we have uh, we have uh, there is a specific service created that points to the ip address in aws because cluster is is created in aws and the pvcs because we use pvcs to store configuration to store specific uh, certificates and, and other important data so if, if we have a cluster created, we can now deploy dashboard because uh, um, uh, traffic enterprise and traffic proxy has dashboard. And it's a nice UI to see what is already deployed, how, how, how routers we deployed, what services we have. And uh, in order to do that, we use a custom resource definition, actually ingress route, the kind of the object is ingress route to create dashboard. And the dashboard will be accessible through that to, through that matching rule. So it use HTTP host header, and using that uh, URL, I will be able to access my dashboard. So let me deploy it. So it has been deployed. 
let me check whether it's in the cluster. Yes, it's available. And now I can go to my browser and to visit a, a website actually to see the dashboard. So as you can see, the dashboard is deployed. It's a standard dashboard. There, there were no any changes on our side to, to, uh, to, to, to yeah, it's, it, it, this is how it works. So as you can see, again, this, that's the cluster topology. So we have the controllers. We can see which of them is a, a master node. We have a proxies, we have a ingresses, routers. And here, as you can see, there is a host that I just deployed. And it's, of course, it's already secured using a Let's Encrypt certificate that has been actually just issued from Let's Encrypt because we use certificate resolver that are added to the traffic enterprise as well as the traffic proxy to issue and to manage Let's Encrypt certificates. Yeah, and now, because traffic is up and running, we need to deploy identity provider. And as I mentioned in my example, uh, uh, we use Google, but we can deploy our own identity provider. And one of the available identity providers in the market is Keycloak. So I just created namespace Keycloak and I will deploy all specific uh, components, uh, uh, Kubernetes manifest to deploy the uh, Keycloak. So there are no any resources in that namespace so let me uh, generate some uh, variables like admin password in order to create kubernetes secret because we need to protect our keycloak and create any authentication to access the keycloak so uh, kubernetes uh, secret has been created keycloak admin has been added And let's check the standard Kubernetes manifest. So we create service, we create deployment. There's actually no, no, nothing related to traffic. That's the standard Kubernetes configuration to deploy application. And let me deploy it. It has been deployed. Service has been uh, created. Yeah, pod is up. It's not yet ready. It will be ready in a few seconds. And now we should create the same similar ingress route in order to access Keycloak UI. So again, it's the name of the name of the uh, ingress route, name of the service and name of the host header because we use the same matching rule uh, on our traffic to redirect incoming requests to the specific resources on Kubernetes. Let me apply it. It has been applied. Let me check whether it's available. Yes, it's available. And let's go back to dashboard to see if, key, if, the, if that specific router has been created. So as you can see, router has been created. We can now uh, verify what's, what is uh, available and we can go to see the dashboard. Yeah, so let me remove special characters. Yeah, it's removed. And a key, key cloak has been deployed. We can see that it's already secured using a, again, let's encrypt and we, we, we can now move further with a demonstration. So now key cloak requires some pre-configuration because by default you need to, there are no any configuration. So I use some specific command that I'm not going to go in details. You can contact me and I will explain what has been uh, what, what we are just configuring here, but there are some of the uh, crucial changes in order to have a Keycloak up and running to be our ad identity provider. So we create user, we create secret for our test application that we will just deploy. Uh, yeah, user ID, password that has been ex has been just generated. So let me run that script. It will connect to the uh, Keycloak API using curl commands and of course the ingress route that we just created. And as you can see, we have a, a credentials that has been generated for us because we create our user that we will be using to authenticate in our application and we use uh, we will deploy demo application and we have a specific secret for that application. 
Yeah, so I will note it down because it will be uh, needed for me later on. So those data has been uh, saved in the file. And now I need to copy a client secret from that previous script and put it in a static configuration file for traffic. So as you can see, issuer, so that's the, our identity provider source. Uh, client ID is already added, demo-app, and we need to add client secret, the random string that has been just generated. We can save the file, we can apply it, Now we can check the uh, password for Keycloak because we would like to log into Keycloak and to see what we have already configured using those uh, scripts that I, that I just run. So as you can see, there are a lot of things that has been created. So we have a, a organization traffic labs. We have a couple of scopes, client scopes, those scopes that I just, that I mentioned at the beginning in my presentation some authentication mechanism. So this example of Kiklo, you can use, as I mentioned, any other identity provider. Some of the security headers. The roles. Again, scopes. And as you can see, we have our uh, base URLs that are very, very important because we will be deploying now application that will be available on the APP uh, that, on that specific domain. So that's required to be correctly configured. So now I will deploy because the Keycloak is already configured. So let me now deploy a very simple application. So it's just a service that will display some specific headers. Uh, we call that application Who Am I? And again, it's a standard Kubernetes deployment service. Let me deploy it. So the app has been deployed. Deployment has been created. Again, it is taking some time to, to have a pods up and running. Service also has been created. That service will be used on traffic to connect with the ingress route. So as you can see, there is the ingress route for that application because again, that will be web application that will be accessible using actually that URL. And the routing will be done on the traffic level using host, uh, HTTP host header. So let me deploy it. It has been deployed and a couple of the middlewares has been already created that I will explain a little uh, 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 later. Yeah, all of them up and running are up and running. Ingress route again, let's check. Yes, it's created. Let's go to dashboard to see if that application is available in a dashboard. Let's go to ingress, routers, <clears throat> and yes, as you can see, it's created. We have a shield here, icon of shields. It means that the, TL, the TLS termination is already added using let's encrypt certificates and let's see the app. Yeah, so that's the example application, lots of uh, HTTP headers are already displayed here, but what is important here that everyone now is able to access that application. So there are no any authentication layer. And let's imagine that it's our uh, application that we are going to protect. So we are going to add application actually on that, uh, on that service. So now let's modify the ingress route and let's enable one of the middlewares that, that uh, I have just created. So that's actually the middleware that allows you to use OpenID Connect authentication. So there are a specific uh, uh, 
configuration that are required to have a, that plugin working. But comparing to the process that I just explained, the, the, the configuration is much easier because you have a couple of fields that you have to just uh, put specific entries in order to have it, uh, in order to, to run correctly. And let me enable that middleware here on the ingress root layer, on the ingress root level. Yeah, let's fix the indentation, it's fixed. Let me re redeploy that uh, configuration. Yeah, it's configured, so something has been have been added. And let's go to the dashboard to see if that middleware is available. As you can see, it's available because middleware has been created here. It's Kubernetes provider, CRD, couple of the uh, um, configuration related to the open ID connect. Let's check secrets once again, because now we should be prompted to enter our login credential to see the same application. So let me refresh the website. And as you can see, I have been just redirected to my identity provider. So I entered the same URL, but I've been redirected to, I, I, I was redirected to the identity provider Keycloak in my organization traffic labs and I using the credential that I have created uh, using those curl commands. And as you can see, now application is available again. So we just we just uh, uh, we have seen how it's easy to add the authentication just on the proxy layer. There are, no, there are no any changes on the service level. Just we have just added one middleware and again those specific uh, headers that are already available and displayed through the demo application. So now we can we can talk about the JSON web token that I just briefly explained in my uh, in the beginning of the presentation. So in order to do that, I will e export some variables. Uh, I will actually create some variables to uh, um, to create that token because token it's a, a encoded string. So keycloak user, and it will be easier to do that in a uh, terminal. So I'm just exporting some variables, user, keycloak password. It matches to the data that have been generate, generated by keycloak. And the client secret that is that matches again to the demo application that we have just deployed. And now let's see uh let's use the jwt variable to create the token so as you can see i'm creating a, a jwt variable and i'm assigning the i'm actually sending http request to the keycloak with a specific header so i'm using the client secret i'm using the uh, keycloak user and keycloak password so th those are actually variables that i have just created and yeah, it has been correctly uh, configured. And now I can just uh, display what is the value of that variable. So JWT contains actually that string. And this is our authentication token. So now we can use the curl command in order to access the same application. But before we do that, we need to change middleware. So from OIDC, we are just changing middleware to JWT authentication. And again, that middleware has been just also added. Let me redeploy it. It has been configured. Let's see whether it's available. Because we disable open ID and enable JWT authentication. So as you can see now, the middleware has been changed and there are at that specific values. Again, let's display it and let's use the curl command with a specific header. So the header is authorization bearer JWT. And actually that's the variable and that will be, a uh, curl will uh, replace that variable to that actually string. And yeah, as you can see, this is actually the same application that we have just seen in the browser. However, that's the terminal, so we can just see HTML tags. 
we will add use uh, we'll use headers uh, just to display headers and we can see that this uh, token has been added and we have actually also a valid http 200 response that means that our application is accessible if the token let's say uh, will will not be valid we will receive 401 http response code let me copy that uh, let me copy that uh, uh, token and let's try to decode it because as I mentioned, that token has a specific uh, structure. So we have a website jwt.io. We can go to debugger and we can decode the, the token. Let me paste it here. Yes, it's, it's already done. And we have a structure that I just mentioned. So we have a header and we have the entire payload so as you can see some of this data are familiar because we have a, our identity provider we have a, our application we have a, some uh, rows already assigned we have a scope and of course the user preferred username and the scope and as you can see there is an open id scope that actually a, 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 a tiny extension that has been added to the authentication uh, to the OAuth in order to provide authentication mechanism. Yeah, so that's all about in regards the Open ID, uh, Connect, and JWT. So let me go to my present. Let me go back to my presentation and let's have a look on the another method of the authentication strategies. So another one is mutual TLS. So mutual TLS authentication. It's it's I would say. We can compare it to the TLS termination, so the SSL in our browser. However, in that case, we need to um, out, uh, we need to check identity of our client because if you use standard TLS termination, you are not sending any certificates to prove who you are to any website. You are just using uh, you are just going to the website and you are you, you settle the uh, a crypted channel have a secure connectivity between your browser and your and the server but in that case we need to also prove who we are so we need to pass our authentication uh, our certificates in the request in order to access the data so it's the mutual SSL authentication requires a little more steps than standard TLS authentication because we need to exchange exchange and validate identity between client and server so that's the entire process how it how it looks like it's 12 steps a little more difficult uh, but yeah this is how it works so let, let me now uh, show you how it works because i have also demo prepared for that middleware for that authentication and what is important here that that uh that that mutual TLS authentication works also with a traffic proxy, with a traffic community addition. So in order to work with a, a, a TLS authentication, we need to generate a certificate authority. We need to generate certificates for the client and for the server. So I already done that using OpenSSL and lots of the comments to, to, to create it. Let me go to full screen and let's play. So now all those certificates will be created as a Kubernetes secrets. So MTLS and who am I certificates will be added to Kubernetes as a, as a Kubernetes objects. So that's the MTLS, that's the who am I, it's already added. And now let's deploy very simple application again, who am I, but more simpler than we have just seen more I would say uh, prepared for the CLI and as you can see I create a specific object on Kubernetes that is a custom custom object it's called TLS option and it creates it refers actually to the client authentication secret MTLS and now let me just disable all TLS configuration and let's keep it empty object here tls will be empty object and we will deploy that, that application and the application will be accessible through that url so let me redeploy it 
Let's check whether it's up and running. Yes, let's go to the dashboard again. And as you can see, application router has been created, application has been deployed, and we have a TLS enabled. There are no any certificates, resolvers added, so traffic will be uh, presenting um, default certificate. That, that you will see that that will be a warning once uh, while we'll be connecting to that URL. So let me use curl trafficclaps.tech. Yeah, uh, that's the problem because we have a self signed certificate. Traffic default certificate is self signed, so curl doesn't trust our certificate. So we need to use specific parameter dash k, it means insecure. And yeah, issuer is traffic default cert. Now we can enable, yeah, we know that it's at 200, that application has been correctly, that request has been collect, correctly completed. And now let's me, let me enable uh, specific certificates that we have just created and redeploy that ingress root once again yes it has been configured has been changed let refresh and as you can see tls section has been has been changed because we have uh, our options tls options that we have just created and now let let's try to access that application as you can see in the previous request i received 200 even with a, uh, using a insecure parameter in curl, but I was able to access the app. But now let's try to, let's see what will happen. Uh, even with a dash K, as you can see, dash K has been, has been uh, added here. I received the information that connection uh, finished alert, but certificate. So we were not able to access the app because we implemented mutual TLS authentication. So now, in order to access the application, we need to use a little longer uh, curl command, and we need to pass our certificate. So we need to use our CA, our key, uh, client, and, uh, client key and client certificate that, that should be added to the HTTP, HTTP request in order to access the app. And yes, because we added those certificates, our identity, uh, our uh, uh, traffic were able to identify who you are because he knows uh, um, uh, the, the issuer and knows that the, um, that the that client certificate has been correctly issued by valid certificate authority. And the application is available, accessible using those uh, certificates. Let's try to with a more verbose, more, more detailed response. And as you can see, the common name, it's traffic CA. And the application is accessible. Yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, I briefly discussed uh, what is the OAuth, what is the open ID connect? How, what is the JWT token? What is the anatomy of the token? Uh, I presented the live demo how those protocols work together, and then I switched to MTLS. So let me go back to my presentation and let me summarize and pass voice to my colleague Drew. Trapped on mute. Awesome. Can you just move me uh, one slide further, Yaku? Yes. Of course. So what did we talk about in this meeting? So there are sort of two fundamental components here. The first component is why does it make sense to authenticate at the proxy layer rather than the services themselves? We hope that we communicated to you that it provides a scalable and secure way to, uh, to proceed in your journey in microservices adoption. And it also allows you to spend more time on um, spending on spending time on what's important to your organization, which is providing an awesome experience for your customers and the users of your applications. 
We also talked about how Traffic Enterprise Edition uh, handles this task individually. And again, Traffic provides all of this functionality out of the box in the same sort of uh, cloud native and very simple way that you've, you've come to know and love about Traffic's uh, proxy and Enterprise Edition and these sorts of tools. And the question box is, and now we're moving on to, so the next portion of the meeting is uh, Q&A. And it looks like the question box is popping. Yeah. Um, so just to pick one out here, at what point in your microservices, at what point in your microservices adoption does it make sense to begin to institute this sort of architecture? Okay, this is a good question. So again, it depends on the how how large is your organization, how many services you have already deployed, and uh, so uh, it all depends how you would like to manage your infrastructure. And uh, it, it's much easier to implement everything on the proxy layer instead of uh, actually adding uh, authentication and all those mechanism on the service layer. So I, I would say that definitely it's it's. It, it depends on the scale, and but you, you need to you need to decide where would you like to use your resources, whether to spend on implementation on the service layer rather than on proxy layer. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, uh, at what point does it make sense to yeah. architect scalable infrastructure? And it's probably from the beginning, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, there are a few questions on performance. Yeah. Um, Jakub, do you have any insights as to the performance repercussions of implementing this middleware? Yeah, we did a, a lot of a performance test and I can provide those information uh, later on to, to the person who has the question. And because we did a lot of a performance test against all of our middlewares, against all of our components that are added to the traffic middleware. so. Uh, uh, we can we can share them. I think we can share them. So we can okay. note down uh, the question and the the person who asked that question. Thank you a lot for that question because it's a, a very important uh, how it impact our performance of the entire infrastructure. Sure. So we'll we'll come back with uh, with the uh, details. Uh, Wolf Siberski, uh, another ski. I'm Drugazowski. Uh, asked, can the MTLS middleware extract client information from the client cert and pass it in headers to the service when forwarding the request? Uh, let me find that, uh, Eric, uh, that question. Can the MTLS middleware extract client information? Yes, it can extract client information because we, she, we, we have seen what is the issuer and what is the client name? And yeah, definitely it might pass that headers to the to the uh, to the request. Very good, very good. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna struggle with your name, and I apologize. Mirways Tebai, uh, in what scenario does it make sense to use MTLS? Again, what's the performance compared to OpenID? Again, it depends what are you going to build because this is an architecture question. We, we, today we have just presented what are the available, a few available uh, authentication strategies. As Drew mentioned at the beginning, there are lots of them. So the question is how you design your, your application, your infrastructure. That's the question to the ar architects. What would, you like to, what would you like to achieve to protect your uh, services? Does the JWT middleware support PATS, P-A-T-S? And that is from a uh, uh, attendee on LinkedIn. Does this support PATS? That's a very good question. I need to check what is it PATS here. I think we can take that question and uh, go back to the, answer, to the person who asked that. Very good. Okay, and is there, it looks like we've uh, actually run through the questions. 
uh, and that's from Radek yeah. Gularski. It's yeah. going to be a, a Polish pride convention on this webinar. I, I think <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, is there any other questions before we uh, we adjourn here? And Jakub, maybe you could. I don't know if this is a lot. If this is uh, permitted by Patricia, but uh, I guess we could probably go over by a few moments if, unless yeah. it's uh, unless it's forbidden. Do as you wish, please. Yeah, okay. So any additional questions? Um, any additional questions that might be popping up here? And we will stick around for a moment. Do you share YAML scripts in GitHub? Yes, I can share it. Uh, as just, yeah, sure, we can prepare. Uh, it's not ready yet because it's our private repo, but I can extract some of those examples and share with them for, for your, for your uh, uh, purposes for, for create your own demo. Definitely, yes. Is it possible to use existing secrets in the middleware object instead of setting the secret value directly, like secret ref? Is and that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is possible. And that is from LinkedIn, I assume? Use existing secrets. Yes, definitely. You can use existing secrets. Yeah, but secrets here, if you are talking about that, uh, because in Kubernetes, you have a couple of secrets. So if you use uh, secrets with a TLS certificate, we need to create specific a uh, type of the secret. So yes, definitely, you can use this. Use it. Cool. Cool. And that was from Manuel. So thank you for the question, man. And I believe that is all. So unless any last second questions strike like a lightning bolt here at the end, which it looks like not, I think we can adjourn the webinar. Well, thank you so much everybody for attending. Uh, my name is Drew, I'm an account executive, like I say here at Traffic. So should you have any questions about our enterprise edition and considering a commercial implementation, I will likely be your point of contact should you be in North America or South America, um, and we can take it from there. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be well.